everyone, and welcome to episode 69 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sobolski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Before we get started with today's interview, it's time to take a minute to tell you about our awesome deal just for you from Skillshare. If you're like me and you love to learn, then lend me your ears. Skillshare has over 20,000 classes to take online to help you pick up those skills you've always wanted to learn, like drawing, writing, or organization. You can take classes on video or workshop them on Zoom, and you can even join groups if you need a little extra help or motivation. Pretty sweet. Friends of the Medieval Podcast can try Skillshare out for two months for free. So why not learn a new skill this summer? Check it out at Medievalist.net slash Skillshare. When you're really passionate about a subject, people will often ask you what it is that got you so involved, whether you can point to a moment or an influence that changed the course of your life. If you're a regular listener, you'll know that it was the classic legends of Robin Hood and King Arthur that got me hooked, along with Disney cartoons. But we've all taken our own different paths to get here, and that is one of the most beautiful things about medieval history. It's so expansive that it can hook you from nearly anywhere. Today, Peter Konechny from Medievalist.net virtually stopped by to fanboy about his favorite medieval book, The Romance of the Three Kingdoms. One of China's most famous works, The Romance of the Three Kingdoms pulls together history, literature, and even theater across the space of a thousand years into one novel. No wonder it's that story that got Peter hooked on the Middle Ages. So without further ado, let's get Peter to tell us why The Romance of the Three Kingdoms is so awesome and why it should be your next summer read. All right, Peter, so you are here to talk to us about your favorite book. I think it's your favorite medieval book, isn't it? It is indeed my favorite. And it's the one that actually got me interested into like medieval history, history in general. So it goes along back. So it's something I, I read every few years as well. So it's uh, uh, I think it's a lifelong love for this uh, 14th century novel. Yeah, you're a super fan. So this is a novel from 14th century China. And it is the romance of the three kingdoms. So Start us off, Peter. What is this book about? Okay, so this is what they would kind of loosely kind of called historical fiction. Historical fiction from 14th century, dealing with events that happened in the 2nd and 3rd century AD in China. So these events are all you know very much real. Uh, this deals with when the Han Dynasty collapses in the late 2nd century. You have a bunch of different uh, warlords and kingdoms kind of rise up. And there's this all this kind of fighting that kind of takes place. It devolves into three major kingdoms, which kind of fight it out for the next like 50 years. But by the, around the year 280, one new dynasty is kind of emerged and, and makes China whole again. So that is the kind of basis for this novel. Okay, so how does it start? <laughs> what makes things fall apart? To begin with. Oh, so the opening lines are the empire long divided must unite, long united must divide. So it, it starts us off a year uh, 169 AD. A new emperor has just come to a throne. But having the kind of t typical problems of many emperors is that they aren't very good at ruling themselves. So they rely on courtiers or like family members, or in this case, eunuchs. And uh, the novelists, you know, say they kind of blame the eunuchs for kind of ruling the court and taking money and bribery and just being corrupt. So you have a, a kingdom that's kind of slowly falling into corruption. The peasants all hate it. The common people all hate it. So there's a, uh, a rising, uh, it's called the Yellow Turbans. This has a large scale rebellion. So, and the story moves on at a fairly quick pace. So, like, this is chapter one. This is all this is happening where the yellow turbans rise up, and you have various people that come to defend the empire, including the hero of this novel. His name is Layu Bay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, part of the novel is focused on Layu Bay and his three, his two kind of adopted brothers. These are. They're all adults, and they kind of all meet together to fight the yellow turbans. And in a kind of a Chinese custom, they form a brotherhood. And it's a very kind of famous scene called the Peach Garden Oath. 
Layu Bay is the elder brother, and he's this kind of generally good guy. He's always uh, evokes all the you know good traits of what a Chinese leader should be. His second brother is Guan Yu, and he's this consummate warrior. He later becomes like known as one of the gods of war in China. So that's how how much he gets revered. And he's this kind of just is this very much stoic warrior. And then there's Zhang Fei, who is the third brother, and he's the more wild one, the one that, you know, if things need to be done, he's the one that goes first in. So they become this this trio that go along fighting against the yellow turbans. And that's where their kind of story starts up with. And meanwhile, there's many other characters who are getting introduced into this novel as well. Yeah, you only gave me this novel like a couple days ago, and I have not finished it. And I have to say, it is like... Game of Thrones in there because not only are there just hundreds of characters, so many characters, but they also have different names and they're killing each other off and there's this like epic struggle for the throne all the time. Like it is it is serious Game of Thrones stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you you get all these kind of characters. Like literally there's thousands of characters and some just get mentioned for one sentence, others not many have like huge huge stories behind them. But they all come. Uh, a lot of them come across as very well developed characters. You get the kind of little tyrant types. You get people that are this kind of rebellious and traitorous. You get leaders that are very intelligent but have a flaw. You have ones that dither around, uh, and you have this kind of like contrast where like people get put into positions and will they do good things or evil things? And good and evil aren't. Doing good things doesn't make you win. And <laughs> doing evil things doesn't make you lose either. So there's, and that's, I guess, the kind of basis of history. So, yeah, there's a whole lot of backstabbing here. Like, I'm not a person who tends to read the type of stories that go back and forth. So it took a lot of research for me to learn about the Wars of the Roses and like pull those people apart and understand who they were. Like this story is so epic that it's it's a big chunky book and the the version that you gave me, the penguin version, is only about a third of the size of the real thing. So this is a lot of empire changing hands and changing hands over and over again. A lot of backstabbing and intrigue. Yeah, as when the kind of the yellow turbans fall, it, it leads to a situation where you have various warlords throughout China, some that have like imperial sanction and some that don't quite have it. And they're jockeying for power. A new emperor comes to the throne, uh, who's again just a boy. He winds up being overthrown by one of the warlords who kind of comes in and says his brother should be the leader, the new emperor. So, yeah, you have a lot of killing, a lot of, you know, uh, treachery here. That kind of sets off this kind of uh, clash where at once they're all against this one tyrant, but then they all start breaking off into feuding each other. And you have Liu Bei that's, uh, for the these early years, is a kind of a small player in these kind of fighting. He's uh, He has this kind of small bits of territory or he's working for someone else. My favorite character is, his name is Cow Cow. He's kind of the main villain of this story. He's a villain, but he's also extremely sharp, intelligent. He has a way of having getting his men to be very loyal to him. He can be very decisive. So he's very interesting. Like there's a, one of the quotes about him is that someone says about him, he is able enough to rule the world, but evil enough to betray it. <laughs> That is your type of character, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And it's important to remember, as you said at the beginning, that these are real people. They're real dudes. Yeah, yeah. Like when we look at this novel, it, it, it's been said that it's about, uh, you know, seven tenths history in three tenths fiction. And the character of Cow Cow is actually very closely associated with like that's who he really was like this. um a lot of the scenes involving him are, are really almost taken verbatim from the, like the historical chronicles that we have of the period. The the novel does kind of make efforts to portray him more. Uh, you know, when, when there's a chance, the choice of making him do being a little more evil or doing a good thing, they choose the evil story of him. So, <laughs> but I found him like very interesting, and like I found into this novel as a teenager. 
which is apparently when you should be reading this book. <laughs> you shouldn't read it when you're an old person. So why is that? Is, why is that? This is like a kind of a Chinese proverb, I believe. But uh, yeah, you don't read uh, *Romance of the Three Kingdoms* as an old person because it gives you all these. Uh, ways of doing politicking and war and treachery and gives you all the kind of guide to that so <laughs> so you, you shouldn't know. read it as an old man <laughs> yeah yeah so because you've got that wisdom there and now this gives you all the tricks of the trade apparently so oh it's too dangerous okay okay i would think it would be the type of thing not to give to a young man so that you don't give him ideas like machiavelli or something like that sure. <laughs> who you also yeah. love for the record I, yes, yes. Like I, I, I see Cow Cow as like this kind of the archetype of the uh, Machiavelli before there's a Machiavelli. So, so yeah, he is one of the kind of major characters. Liu Bei becomes this other kind of major character. They kind of lead to these three kingdoms. The uh, Sun family rules like southern China. They become the third major player. In, in, a, in a sense, there's a lot of battles, a lot of political intrigue that we get to see. And uh, a lot of people will read this as a kind of guide to, you can be read as a guide to leadership, the way people are put into certain situations and they have to make political choices. What do they do? What And what were the results of that? So you can be looked at a, a leadership or warfare because there's a lot of like warfare stratagems. There's a little bit of Sun Tzu's uh, art of war in here. It's almost like this is the art of war played out where we have like kind of stratagems and maneuvers and things like that, uh, like on the battlefield in, in battles and sieges, how, how they should be done, what happens. So, yeah. And this this is why it kind of lends itself to strategy games as well, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and that's how I, I actually got in, into this. Uh, it was uh, with a couple of friends of mine. Uh, we uh, were playing a game called Romance of the Three Kingdoms, part two, apparently. So, uh, <laughs> And this is like from the makers of a company called Koei in Japan. And they've done like a series. I think they're like somewhere in like Romance of the Three Kingdoms part like 15 now. It's been a, you know, a big moneymaker for them. So where you actually rule one of these little kingdoms and... So, yeah, this is really it. It was playing a game and the little snippets of information they gave us about these characters that, you know, led me into like wanting to learn more about it. And it took me months and months to actually find an English translation of this book. But I eventually did. And then I, and there's been a few other translations that have come out since I was just immediately hooked into its narrative. And again, you know, I think for like a, a teenage guy kind of looking at it, the story of warriors and men being men, you know, oh boy. <laughs> uh, that, you know, I can see like how kind of an influence and later on, uh, you know, I kind of more appreciated the history and like, I enjoy looking at it both as a work of history in itself and how the author chooses to use what history in what do they fictionalize and how did they do it? So I find that another kind of aspect that I've really enjoyed. Yeah, so reading the beginning of the Penguin version, though, so the one I was looking at was translated by Martin Palmer, and he was talking about this novelization of history being quite a lot like Shakespeare's reimagining the rise of the Tudors, so reimagining history and the figures from history. And I thought that was kind of an interesting parallel where you take like some real people and you fictionalize them in a way that it's kind of propagandist, but it's meant to kind of teach you something about rulership and things like that. And I thought that was an interesting comparison. But what I what I appreciated having read the introduction by Martin Palmer was that it is a novel and it's got some really cool things in it as a novel where it's saying at the end of a chapter, what happens next? Find out. And <laughs> it's kind of cool that way. But it also has worked in... So the story of the fall of the Han Dynasty has been going on for a thousand years. People have been telling it before it becomes this novel. And so the novelist uses poetry that people have created about this story. He works that into the narrative as well. And he works in little pieces of what Martin Palmer suggests are operas and stories and plays about this as well. So it's kind of a collection, like a novelization of the story, but it's also integrating history poetry and all sorts of other different sources which i think is really cool yeah yeah like this story of the kind of three kingdoms was extremely popular apparently 
in China, in medieval China, where there are dozens of uh, plays about some of the characters, some of that is is incorporated into that. Like our earliest history, actually, of these events falls back into the third century. Contemporary with with many of the people that actually wrote an account. Then we also have, again, more information from the 5th century. Uh, you kind of have various other kind of Chinese like historical encyclopedias that uh, kind of flesh out the story a bit more. But then you have all these plays and folk literature that seems to have been incorporated into that, as well as the poetry. And uh, and the poetry actually comes from, in many cases, the people that are, are there. Uh, we like... Cao Cao, uh, we, there are uh, uh, many surviving poems by him. Uh, one of his sons is considered one of the greatest poets in Chinese history. So uh, that kind of gets incorporated somewhat into, into that as well. So unfortunately, like the edition that we kind of see, while the novel was written in the 14th century, it, it got re-edited in the like 16th century and, some, and a lot of the poetry got taken out. So <laughs> we're actually seeing a slimmed down version of Romance of the Three Kingdoms as opposed to one that w- it was originally done in the 14th century. Well, apparently the original is almost a million Chinese characters long, <laughs> which is a lot. The version that I have mentions it being Chinese. I don't know which dialect it's in, but uh, yeah, almost a million characters. So that is a very long novel, <laughs> longer than many of the things you'll find in English. Most of the things you find in English at the time. It's certainly like a considered an epic. And of course, like it's become a hugely popular in China ever since the uh, 14th century. This uh, is considered like one of the four great classics of, of like ancient Chinese literature. And so people like besides me getting into, ga- into games, there's been television shows. There was a kind of a blockbuster movie about the Battle of Red Cliffs, which is one of the probably the peak uh, moment in the story is this battle that happens in the year 208. Maybe about you know 10 years ago, uh, like a, a film was done in China that has all the hallmarks of being like a Hollywood blockbuster. And like there's countless kinds of you know, television and other kind of versions of it, as well as as books, uh, the publications of, of, of the versions. So it's still an incredibly popular kind of book. Have you seen any of the adaptations of it or you just played the game so far? No, I've uh, I've uh, I remember the first, one of the first things I was able to see was like the cartoon version. <laughs> really? Cool. Yeah. yeah kind of a Japanese anime uh, version that, you know, maybe covered like the first quarter of the uh, novel. So there's that. I've, I've seen the movie, which is really quite epic. <laughs> and I've come across other kind of scattered references to it as well. So uh, I'd love to learn more and just see how people react to that. And of course, you know, with video games, this is like very, very popular. So yeah, because there's so many players, right? It could go in any direction. And History is like that, where it's not inevitable that it's going to go in one direction or another. So, okay, so why do they do a movie about the Battle of Red Cliffs? What happens in this battle? Yeah, yeah, this is uh, a point where Cao Cao has kind of emerged to control all of northern China. Liu Bei is basically on the run. His forces get defeated, and he has to run to the Sun family. This ruler's name is Sun Quan. They convince him that only together they're going to be able to defeat Cao Cao and they kind of stop because if like Liu Bei gets defeated, Sun Quan will as well. So they, they kind of put up this stand along the Yangtze River, which is the major river in southern China. And this has often been like a kind of contested battlefield, this river itself. Cao Cao sends an army and we're talking about like hundreds of thousands of soldiers as reported in the Chronicles where they're able to construct a kind of a massive fleet that sail down the down the river and La, Liu Bei and uh, Sun Quan. Now, as rulers, Liu Bei and Sun Quan don't actually take very part, much part of the fighting. They leave it to their uh, generals. And the, even the generals are kind of more scholarly type people. So we have a guy named Zhu Liang, who's younger than Liu Bei, but is his advisor. And he has almost like magical abilities to know the weather and to know what people are thinking. Like he's one of those people, like he knows it all. Right. And he can like guess the enemy's movements before even they know. So they're able to allure Cao Cao into a kind of a plot to kind of wipe out his fleet. And Cao Cao's men, after basically been like campaigning for years, they seem to be tired out. 
they're not used to river fi- fighting on water. Uh, so the, it leads to this kind of epic clash where they, they're able to f- defeat Cow Cow by setting his, uh, his fleet on fire, which makes a great movie scene. Like, so. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I guess so. And it's one of these things where trickery is not seen as dishonorable, right? No, no. It's uh, like uh, everyone puts in various tactics. In some cases, like the good guys have mixed emotions about employing such tricks you know like they say well no we should just fight you know man on man right but uh, as part of the novel like if you're looking at an idea of leadership is like when do you employ the underhanded maneuvers or the kind of, of tricks you know when is that an opportune time to do it well speaking of underhanded tricks one of the parts that i was interested in learning more about and really into was um, the part where two guys are promised the same woman and she plays them off each other in order to topple the guy who's currently in power. So what happens in that story? Yeah, yeah. We have, uh, it's, it's, it happens early on. We have this tyrant named Dong Zhuo and he's the one that overthrows the emperor, replaces him with his brother. He's ruling like a tyrant. The character, evil characters, he's just the most ruthless, but, you know, not particularly bright uh, <laughs> version. And he has his, like, best warrior, also adopted son. His name is Lu Bu. And Lu Bu is this, like, warrior par excellence, the kind of hero in all ways. But he's also comes across as this treacherous person. Like, he joins Dong Zhuo by killing his first ruler, that's kind of like ingrained in his personality. And uh, one of the kind of people that's loyal to the empire, just an official, figured out as a way to the, play these two off against each other with the hopes they would kill each other off. And so he uh, has his daughter named Daoshan, and she's the most beautiful person in, in China. <laughs> she is instructed to kind of, you know, seduce both of them. She's telling Dong Shuo, you know, how much she loves him and how much she she's afraid of Lu Bu. But at the same time, she's like making advances on Lu Bu and saying like, oh, Dong Shuo is going to marry me and I'm so scared. And gradually gets those two to fight each other, where Lu Bu eventually murders Dong Shuo and marries Dai Shan. And their story does not become happily ever after, though, so... <laughs> Well, and you were just telling me that she is the nicest of of all the women who are in this story as well. <laughs> yeah, like uh, th- this is not a story uh, of you know equality. Like, very few women get betrayed in any positive light at all. Most, uh, like again, it's the kind of thing that women shouldn't be involved in politics. So mm-hmm. everything they're doing is portrayed negatively. You do get like examples of women that are, are portrayed heroically, but those are their uh, attitudes of medieval Chinese ideas of, uh, of heroism. So sacrificing one for your son, things like that. Your honor and your family come first before you do. So, but when it comes to kind of any kind of political intrigue, the authors tend to kind of blame them for troubles. <laughs> yeah, well, that's not really a surprise. It's not really a surprise. In that incident, I think they were saying, you don't even need to fight battles once you get a woman involved. That's it. It's all going to go south. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, in a sense, like there's, uh, you know, there's certain biases, like a lot, a lot of biases that begin against eunuchs as being not men. So, you know, they shouldn't be involved in, in court politics. And when they do, this is what happens. You have biases against the southern half of China, where, you know, the kind of kingdoms in the south aren't as sturdy and manly as the kingdoms of the north. Yeah. Do you think that um, having looked at, you've looked a little bit at the history as well, is this reflecting the 14th century, do you think, or is this reflecting the second and third century? I, I think it, it probably deals a lot with like a, the 14th century and why, you know, the author wrote it. It's attributed to Lo Guanzhong and it's believed, and I, I think this is right, that he may have decided to compose it because this was a time when the there was a new change of dynasty. Like we have the end of the like Yuan dynasty where like that was Mongol controlled China and you have a new like the Ming dynasty emerging and this is almost essentially as a guide to ruling. This is a, a, a kingdom based in you know northern China, around Beijing, 
so I think he kind of incorporates that, like a lot of, you know, those ideas of how China should be governed. And I also find it very interesting, the kind of theme of China having to unite and break apart. And it's like a theme that they kind of repeat, like this is, you know, happens throughout Chinese history where we have an empire, then the empire splits off into many different kingdoms. Then we see them, uh, one empire, you know, one empire become dominant. And this is a cycle that seems to happen. There's a little bit of like that destiny and cycle of history that's going here. And it's very reflective of the, in today's China, where there's this kind of urge by the mainland China to unite where, you know, like they see maybe that China hasn't been united in the last, say, 150 years, and they're trying to unite with kind of the holdouts being Hong Kong and Taiwan. Yeah, it's talking with Valerie Hansen a couple of weeks ago, thinking about like what China was like in the Middle Ages. And uh, specifically, she was talking about, about around the year 1000. It's very interesting when you think about it, it's such a huge geographical area being united during a time when you know you don't have the same technology that we do now and it's interesting that even even with all of the intrigue and stuff that's going on in the romance of the three kingdoms during that time you know it's interesting that it only split into three kingdoms instead of thousands you know it's such a huge area it's uh, it speaks to how centralized it was for so long that it only split off into three kingdoms instead of splintering you know what i mean yeah, yeah, like even like this period of division that we kind of see here with like just before the three kingdoms where you literally have maybe maybe see a dozen states, they quickly fight with each other and we is just this uh, one captures another, the third captures a second, two sides that gain power, they fight each other. You get quite a lot of that. But yeah, within China I think that you have this idea that yeah, if we are united you know, this is how how strong China can be. And they can kind of look back at, at times when they were united, like the Han Dynasty, the Tang as well, even the Ming Dynasty as kind of golden ages of Chinese history. And division is when you know there are problems. Yeah. Well, I honestly don't know enough about Chinese politics at the moment to wade into those waters. But yeah, uh, but yeah this is a really, it, the way that this story plays out, this novel plays out, it really is speaking to the fact that they want to have a unity that works for everybody and that is involved in having a strong leadership that's not undermined by either family or courtiers or other people. You need to have a strong emperor at the center of it, at least in this novel, to make a strong empire. And uh, yeah, that's throughout the book, kind of what, what this 14th century ideal is supposed to be like. Yeah, like Liu, Liu Bei is portrayed as the good ruler, as the one that everyone should strive to be. You know, he is, he's pious, filial, kind-hearted. He also lets his advisors and generals do their thing. So, you know, he's not like a hands-on ruler. And that's kind of an interesting. So we have a lot, a lot of it is given priority to Zhu Liang, the wise and intelligent minister who seems to do everything and know everything. So it's interesting. That's how they kind of play off government. And, uh, and, you know, it's interesting the personalities. It always fascinated me how rulers' personalities determined the, the fate of their kingdoms, right? So yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's history for you, right? Yeah, yeah. And you can so, still, once the borders are opened again and people can travel, you can still actually visit graves and shrines that are dedicated to these people. So that you can still visit the graves of some of the people who are involved in the story of the romance of the three kingdoms. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. And like, uh, there has been like archae uh, several archaeological finds have been associated with Cao Cao in recent years. Again, this is like, I think anything that kind of speaks of this particular period will get a lot of attention. And yeah, there are places in like uh, uh, south uh, southwest of China where there are the mausoleums of various of, of some of the rulers. And yeah, and if you kind of think this is like 2000, almost 2000 years ago and like there uh, remains in kind of places that have been that well preserved and the history has that been well preserved. Yeah, it's cool. It's I'm glad that you are introducing me and us to this. You have several editions of this. Is there an edition that you think people should pick up if they're if they want to read it or do you think that they're you could get the gist of it from pretty much any translation yeah yeah like all the translations offer a bit of a different flavor like um when i first came across it there was only one translation is named Ruit taylor 
and it was a translation done in, in I think it was the 1920s. So it's uh, it's actually you can get it online uh, in public domain. The, the main problem I remember of reading that was it was just terribly translated. The, uh, the words were just misspelled, like the word the was misspelled. <laughs> if you do come across, you know, it can be a bit of an annoying kind of version to look at. I guess like the most academic done was done by Moss Roberts. And it doesn't have, I guess, the kind of flair of the Brew Taylor translation, but has like the kind of academic chops uh, as well as, you know, footnotes, which is something I quite like. True. <laughs> the, uh, so you have that. And then, yeah, we actually have this new translation from Penguin. And it, it's just interesting. You, you can compare the, 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 the changes can be sometimes pretty minor in way translation. But I, I think I guess it depends on how how much academic and how much kind of flowing you want it to be. So, OK, so if the non-academic version that you would people should read is is the Penguin one. I think so. I think okay. that's it's like I, I'd say you would go with that uh, again. It's not the full edition. So, yeah, uh, you, you do quite miss out on quite a bit. And yeah, so you'd go with that. I don't think you'd you know, like Brew Taylor. You know, it's that's the one if you want like online, that's the easiest one to kind of just come across and grab for free. And I think the in the online translations, they've actually cleared up a lot of the spelling jargon and things like that. But, <laughs> that's handy. Yeah. And then with the academic, if you want like a, a little bit of a deeper look into it and you want things like observations on what these characters are actually doing and what it might represent, uh, yeah, you can go with Moss Roberts. All right. I'm sure we will have links to all of those versions in our show notes. Well, thank you for fanboying about your favorite book today. Appreciate thank it. <laughs> yes, I encourage anyone that's like, if you got, you know, like a week or two and you want to get into a good tale of warriors being warriors and generals being generals and rulers being rulers where lots of things happen and uh, you get excitement and uh just just a tad bit of magic tad bit of magic and you know a couple of ghosts that's it so <laughs> it's a good quarantine read yep all right so what's on the website for us this week so uh, this week we've had a lot of different pieces that come from our writers, uh, including yourself. So you have this great tale of the tale of the Buddha as told in medieval Europe. Uh, so that's very kind of fascinating. Adam Ali is taking a look at his Mamluks. And this time there's the Mamluks against the Mongols, uh, another area that's close to my heart. And also we have a piece from Stephen Mulberger looking at like kind of funny stories from the Hundred Years' War. <laughs> that's lots of good stuff this week a nice range of things oh yeah and uh you know there's kind of tons of news is coming out uh i've been listening to the international medieval congress which is doing their virtual version this week uh and so there's been uh things that i've been kind of learning including uh about some interesting stuff about the battle of fulford which is one of the battles of 1066 so I wish I was at the conference, but it's a, uh, really good to actually be able to kind of hear some of the, you know, really good, interesting papers that are being given. And hopefully, we'll, you know, this will kind of lead to some more stuff that we can talk about. Yeah, we would have been there this week. It would have been awesome. But this is still pretty good that you can go to the conference virtually. All right. Thanks, Peter. Good to talk to you. And uh, lots of great stuff on the website this week. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you to all of our patrons on Patreon.com for keeping this podcast fire lit. If you haven't been there yet, why not check out our Patreon page where you can find sweet deals on Medieval Warfare Magazine, the Medieval Magazine, our book club, and even an ad-free version of Medievalist.net. Your support keeps this podcast on the air, so if you are a patron, this thank you is straight from my heart to yours. All of the awesomeness is at patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from Chinese political intrigue to English peasants, follow medievalists.net on Facebook or Twitter at medievalists. You can follow me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books, including my latest one, Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, at all your favorite bookstores. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself an epic day.